Well, thank you for coming. Um, this talk is going to be the first time we do it. Um, so hopefully you cut us some slack, but you know, feel free to ask questions. I mean, you know, so don't make it easy. Um, so I'll introduce us quickly. So this is my colleague, Paul. Um, he's a senior engineer at IBM and um, does all kinds of things. Um, if you go to the Knative booth, uh, you will see him because he's a committer and has contributed tons to Knative, uh, but now is working with me on Open Quantum uh, at IBM. So I'm Max, uh, some people call me Dr. Max, but Max is fine. Yes, I do have a PhD, but it's not in quantum physics. So, <laughs> so this is new territory for me. And I'm a distinguished engineer at IBM, and I also used to do uh, open serverless. So I did contribute to Knative as well, uh, pioneering the CLI. So, uh, you know, we can talk about that. And the quantum effort came because, as you'll see, there's a little bit of overlap, but not too much. Um, so that's that. Okay, so the talk is divided into three parts. I'm gonna do the first part, and um, Paul is actually gonna go over how. So I'm gonna try to give you my best intuition of quantum computing or quantum computers, and more importantly, why are they important? Why, why should you care? And Paul is gonna get into a little bit more details by going over how you actually program a quantum computer, at least using some of the tools that we have at IBM, and then how Kubernetes can actually play into this uh, emerging uh, field. Uh, and there was gonna be some live demos as well, so hopefully it works. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so what is quantum computing? I mean, obviously everybody here probably have some notion of regular uh, computers. And just giving myself some time so I don't speak too much. Um, and of course, you know, you know, we all have you know supercomputers in our pockets, right? And quantum computers are actually very different, but fundamentally there's some some similarities as well, right? So we're going to try to at least give you the intuition uh, behind them. So first is, you know, thinking of, um, yeah, problems, right? So if you've taken a complexity theory class, you know that computers are, are, are great at solving problems, uh, but believe it or not, there's a lot of problem that you cannot solve, or at least it would take you so much time to solve them that the best computers we have right now, or even supercomputers much bigger than the ones you have in your pocket, uh, would not be able to solve them. And part of the reason is because the best algorithms that we know tend to require a lot of operations. And computers are pretty straightforward. They just compute operations. Uh, and you could resolve, you could take any operation, all of the computers that you have in your pocket to reduce them to essentially doing additions. You know, So at the end of the day, that's pretty much what you're doing. Um, but if those numbers to actually solve a problem are very big, then you can't use the classical class of computers to solve them. Okay, and this is not theoretical, it's actually very practical. And we're gonna get into uh, an example that we all use and you use every day, okay? For people that have taken complexity uh, theory classes, you understand this, but for some people it might be um, a surprise, but it's very true. And the class that we cannot solve is actually significantly big. Um, and we're gonna get into some example of this. Quantum computers will try, you know, help you solve not all of them. So we're not gonna be doing TikTok on quantum computers, okay? So don't be, don't worry about that. But there are some problems where you can actually solve it uh, significantly faster. And this is, and because some of those problems are critical, this is why you should care. One of the problems, and it's not just one, but it's uh, one example, is trying to uh, do a lot of research around um, you know, solid state uh, or any molecule uh, that are 
kind of complex, even biological, uh, you know, research in that space, because you have to compute the state or the energy state of some of those uh, ions or the molecules. And if you're trying, like, if you're, um, you know, creating an EV and you want to create better batteries, then you're essentially, you know, computing quite a bit of these, you know, imaginary molecules, and you have to understand the state of it, and it, it, the physics is actually well understood, but the number of computation that you need to do tends to be so large that classical computers would take forever, and quantum computers can do it like this. Another example of this that's more, that's closer to us is, you know, classic traveling salesman, you know. Uh, that's a very classic problem in, in uh, complexity theory that you can actually do in, with quantum computers very fast. So it's logistics, and there are real companies right now uh, using quantum computers to um, solve some of those problems. Now, another problem that I want to get into a little bit more after is essentially uh, cryptography. So the, the basic primer in cryptography is that they're all, especially the recent ones, uh, the ones that we all use, like say, for instance, RSA, is based on asymmetric keys, okay? cryptography. So basically you have two numbers, you multiply them to the fifth primes, and then you have now a, uh, another number, and that other number, you can make it public, and that's your public key. And the reason this works, that you can use that multiplied number to encrypt data, is because it's very hard to find the primes from an existing number. Okay, so given any number, if I ask you, give me the two primes, when you multiply them, it gives you that initial number, it's extremely hard. And it's, it, you think, no, it is freaking hard. I mean, it's basically more time than, uh, than we have to live, you know, in the current computers. So if you get big, large enough primes and you create these public keys, I'm simplifying a lot, but you can essentially encrypt everything. So the whole world, you know, um, you could say all of, um, you know, commerce right now on the web is essentially using these kind of uh, cryptography. The sad part, and this is where quantum computers come in, is that with, um, and I guess there's another example of, of yeah, this, right? Yeah, exponential. Right, so it's part of the reason it takes so long to, um, find the primes is because um, the best known algorithm right now tends to be exponential. So you essentially would need a really large number of time because of the nature of exponential, it goes very fast. So the larger your number that you are using for your keys, uh, the more time it would take you for the best known algorithm right now to solve it, okay? So how do quantum computers come in and solve these problems? So this is the part where I'm going to ask you to, I guess I'm going to try to give you the intuition behind it. So if you think of, uh, I, I mentioned at the beginning that all of your, you know, the phone that we have, all of it is based on these classical computers where basically you have gates and you can build, let's say for instance, an adder because pretty much everything else will build on that. And you can put two bits, let's say you're adding two numbers, you know, one or zero, and one or zero, and you can go to the other and then you get a result. So one one will give you three, uh, um, would give you two, one zero, uh, zero one will give you one, right, and so on. And that's because the bits are either one or zero. In a quantum computer, you don't have that. You have this notion of qubits. Now, what's a qubit? It builds on uh, quantum physics where, you know, matter, a lot of matter or at least the uh, initial representation is in this sort of, you know, in this state where all of the possible uh, spins, you know, zeros or one can be at the same time. So what ends up happening is if you have, let's say, four qubits, like this is represented here, the qubits can be in any of the different states. So that's interesting, but that's actually not enough. What's important is that in addition to being in those states, is you can also have them be, um, so this is called superposition of the state. 
you can also have them be entangled. And that's what's important. So the qubits, if you can entangle them, then it means that when you run them to a gate, so this is a circuit, a uh, quantum circuit, you can actually specify the ones that you want to uh, entangle and get one result. Because otherwise, what would end up happening is, let's say this was an adder and you had four uh, you know, bits, then you would get a result that you would not know. But with the quantum circuits that we can build today, assuming those qubits are perfect, uh, so they don't have errors, um, you could actually solve them. Uh, you could, with the circuit, get a result that you want. What ends up happening typically, though, is that the qubits are not perfect. So even though they can be in zero and one, uh, they tend to get out of coherence. So basically, instead of being super, super in superposition and entangled, some of them will get out of entanglement. So what you end up having to do, let's say this was an adder, and it's a simple circuit, okay? Um, you would have additional numbers, so you're adding more to use that to error correct. And in many ways, it's not too hard to get few numbers of qubits, but for real problems, like for instance what we talked about, you need large numbers. So let's kind of look into this. So in, I think, 1994, um, Peter Shore, uh, I think he was doing his uh, post-doctorate post at, at Berkeley. He came up with an algorithm that goes by his name, Shor's algorithm, that actually can um, factor numbers in almost pretty much constant time. So this is the blue part. And the best known algorithm right now for factoring um, numbers is number field, and you can see it's exponential. Right. So what does that mean? That means that for what you would do, like say on your WhatsApp, which is about 256 bit, uh, bits, you would need two to the 25 or more than that, right? So two to the 25 is for about 220. And if you go to 56, you can see it goes to about two, uh, 10 to 25, 10 to maybe about 30. And th those numbers don't mean too much to you maybe, but if you think how many stars in the universe, it's 10 to the 50. So the problem with you know, the existing algorithms is that it would take pretty much you know, this number of operations to be able to factor from the public key. With a quantum computer and using Shor's algorithm, you're basically at constant time. So you can keep increasing it. So it doesn't matter how big the key is, you can factor in almost constant time. Now, you shouldn't be too worried because in order for you to solve this algorithm, you need, um, I think it's in the order of about 8,000 qubits that are perfect. But that's where we are today. Uh, when Shores uh, created his algorithm, I think it was in the order of 2 million qubits. So that's what people expected that you needed to do. So what the point is that the technology is improving much faster, and the qubits are better and better, meaning that they are more perfect, meaning that you don't have to do error correction, so the number of operations is getting close to what you would expect in Troy's algorithm. So for some problems, and that's the key thing, quantum computers will make um, solving those problems extremely, extremely fast. Uh, just uh, as a last thing, and then we'll go to Paul. Um, around November of last year, there was a group of Chinese researchers that claimed that they were able to decrypt WhatsApp messages over a couple hours. And it turned out that there were some problems in their experiment, but there are lots of people doing this right now. And why is that a problem? Not for WhatsApp messages, but if you're a bank or if you're a government, and you're trying to keep secrets, what do you do? You encrypt. And you use 256, 300, uh, you know, RSA. It won't matter very soon. Uh, so a lot of bad actors, what they're doing is they're keeping this encrypted data to decrypt later. So that's one of the reasons why quantum computers matter. So hopefully you're convinced. But if you're not convinced, uh, Paul will try to do a better job of showing you how you can program them and real problems, and then how Kubernetes plays into uh, 
this, this space. Just to be clear, I don't have a quantum computer in my pocket or anything like that. So, um, you know, I mean, I, you know, that's, you know, the picture. I think that's the one that we have at the Cleveland Clinic right now. I mean, you know, they're big machines. They have electrons that have been, had spin put on them that are kept at like, basically almost as cold as you can possibly make a thing like down to your like absolute zero. Um, and that's what we use to run these quantum calculations. So how do we do that? Um, and we don't expect people to be, you know, have PhDs in quantum mechanics or physics to be able to write quantum programs. Um, you know, similar to what we've done with classical computers where we started off, we had, you know, we wrote things in assembly and then we developed higher level languages like C and things that let us, you know, abstract away and, and write for different architectures. We've done similar things with quantum computing. Um, so how we do quantum computing is we use, you know, SDKs. Um, and the most popular one that we have is something called QuizKit. Uh, QuizKit's an open, an open source quantum computing SDK. Uh, it's been around since 2017. We've got over 100 contributors, 3,000 stars on GitHub. Um, you know, really a lot of stuff um, going on there. The links on there, uh, quizkit.org. Um, we'll have links um, and things at the end as well that people can access if they want those things. Um, what QuizKit does is it provides you tools to write and run quantum code, um, kind of at the most basic. Um, it gives you tools for building these quantum programs out of the circuits that we had showed earlier. Um, there's also a collection of quantum algorithms. So you don't have to re-implement every quantum algorithm. A lot of them are there for you um, that you could just call it as functions and methods. Uh, there's a number of applications for different industry use cases. So, you know, there's a lot of quantum machine learning. Um, we have algorithms for that that people can use. Um, in chemistry and things like that, as Max was saying, you know, some of these chemical reactions, there are applications out there that you can use, that you can pull in. We're gonna demo one of those um, a little later. Finance um, is big in quantum. Optimization, you know, the, the traveling salesperson that Max mentioned, there's algorithms out there for that that you can use in the QuizKit toolkit. Um, and lastly, running quantum programs. So there's both simulators, so if you don't have access to a quantum computer, you can simulate these and still run them kind of on your laptop with a little less power. Or you can call out to different quantum computers, you know, from different quantum providers. There's a, a provider tool you put, you pick the provider, you attach to your quantum computer um, and run it. Okay, that's what QuizKit is. How do we do it? And again, it's like regular software development. There's a four step process for doing this. Um, first thing you do is you build your quantum circuit and QuizKit's uh, Python tools. So you can write kind of some Python to build out your circuit. We'll look at that here in a minute. Um, like any other, well, not like every, but any, like any compiled language, the next thing you do is you're gonna compile um, your circuit for the particular architecture you're gonna run it on. Um, different, you know, computers have different architectures, so in quantum, it's a similar thing. Uh, then you run it, and then lastly, you analyze your results. And that's how you run a quantum workload. So, um, we're gonna do a demo here, and this is live, so this may or may not, you know, we're gonna, we're gonna run kind of by the seat of our pants here a little bit. Um, so, okay, now of course I can't see it on this screen, but um, again, this is a, can, how, it, for people in the back of the room, can you read anything on this? Um, how about now? I feel like an eye doctor. All right, cool. All right, um, so I'm not gonna, whoops. Ah, all right, um, bear with me once I gotta find which screen I'm on. There we go, okay, now where's the mouse? Okay, all right, so, um, Given um, what time are we at? We got like about 15 minutes. So I'm gonna go a little quick here. So the build step, um, first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna just declare a circuit. Again, this is the Kiska thing. This is regular Python. It should look fairly simple. Um, we're gonna declare a circuit with two qubits and we're gonna have two regular bits at the end. So we're gonna have our two kind of quantum atoms here that we're gonna do some stuff to and we're gonna get a measurement at the end. Um, so we're gonna do that here. And then uh, we're gonna build a little circuit and Rather than go over, so we're, we're putting gates on, and the gates are just simple, like circuit dot gate name. So an H gate is an H, a C not gate is a CX, and then we're gonna measure it. And this, uh, if you wanna see what that looks like, we can make that look pretty. Well, we can make it look pretty when it's on the screen entirely. And there you go, so you've got two qubits, Q0, Q1. We've got two measurements, we're gonna get a zero or one at the end. So we're gonna have a zero, zero, or a one, one when we run this thing. And the way this quantum gate works, not to get too into the weeds, but it's basically going to give us, you know, we've, the H gate's going to put our qubit in our superposition so we don't know what it is. We're going to entangle it with the C naught gate, which means basically our output when we measure is going to be 50 50 
give or take a little bit if it's a zero or a one. Um, so that's, we, this is our circuit, we've built it, now let's compile it. Um, given that networks are always fun, I'm gonna do a simulator today, um, but we're gonna simulate this um, and then compile it. Our compiler is just a call to transpile with the circuit and the back end we wanna uh, build it for. Uh, we're gonna run it, it's just, again, simulator.run, nice and easy. It runs and then it's done and then we can do, you know, some counts, we can see we ran 0011, that's our, you know, zero and one, roughly split evenly, 49 to 511, and then if we wanna, you know, we're in a notebook, so we could do notebook-driven development and build some histograms um, at the end there. So that's a trivial example or a fairly simple example, but you can obviously see how you could build this up to much more depth if you wanted to, giving you a nice little visual toolkit um, to work your way through that. So that's kind of quiz kit um, as a demo. Now I'm gonna try to get back to the slides if I can find them. There we go, um, and then and just come back to the, pull the presenter's notes back up if I can click on the right thing, and then bring this back to my other screen. Is it because you're using Linux? Don't blame Linux. <laughs> We're at a Linux Foundation event. Don't don't blame Linux. Um, all right, so that's our demo. Um, let me just come back over here. All right, um, so we're 20 minutes in. We're at Cloud Native Con, KubeCon. We haven't talked about Kubernetes yet. Um, let's rectify that. How do we make quantum computing cloud native? Um, or also known as why are we here talking about quantum at KubeCon Cloud Native Con? Um, you know, so what's the role? Where, where does, what role does Kubernetes play? And if we think about kind of what Kubernetes is, you know, it's an orchestrator. You know, if we want to go back to, you know, Kubernetes comes from the Greek that means pilot or helmsman or navigator or a couple other things. And we can use Kubernetes to run a whole bunch of different workloads. So we're all familiar with running Kubernetes on cloud. You can use Kubernetes to run on-prem workloads. You can call out to high-performance computers. Kind of the takeaway here is you can use Kubernetes to run a whole bunch of different heterogeneous computes. Um, and quantum is just another kind of heterogeneous compute that we can add into these particular workflows. Um, and we can use the one that makes the most sense for the problem or the part of the problem that we're attempting to build. So if it makes sense to build part of our, our program or our algorithm as a quantum algorithm, let's do that. If it makes more sense to run it on HPC, let's run it on HPC, so on and so forth. And so to kind of think about this, let's use kind of something that's a bit more um, complex than the, the last example I showed. Let's take an, you know, an application kind of at the outset, you know, it's, it's a big problem, but we can break that problem down into smaller pieces. And each of those pieces can be broken down into smaller pieces. Some of those pieces may be best served by building a quantum algorithm, building a quantum circuit to build our calculation if we have a quantum algorithm and enough qubits to do so. But we can break this down into kind of a bunch of smaller problems, compute those results, and then combine those results back up to get the final result. Um, this should be familiar to anybody who's grinded leak code recently. This is divide and conquer, right? You know, you take a big problem, break it down into pieces, combine those pieces back together. But you need something to kind of orchestrate that. That's where Kubernetes comes in, and that's where kind of what we've called uh, quantum serverless, quantum middleware plays a role. So this is an open source software that we built that's out there, people are contributing to, that's used to make tools to build and orchestrate these quantum and classical workloads um, for people to run, you know, it in the optimal place. So again, if you if you had a quantum workload, and again, it's not quantum or classical, it's quantum and classical. So if you take, you know, a particular workload, you send it to Kubernetes, you send your program, quantum service will figure out, you know, do we need to run it in quantum? Does it need to be run classically, with HPC, whatever, so on and so forth. It'll kind of go out and do that. Um, so that's a lot of abstract stuff. We've got 10 minutes. Let's see if we can get through a couple of examples. Um, so simply, so what does this look like in practice? Um, let's take, you know, the first example. Um, let's say we want to calculate the ground state energy for lithium hydride. This is a kind of a basic chemistry example where we're gonna, and this can be done as, as a quantum algorithm. There's a, a quantum equation you can solve. And you can also, and you can, do, and you can do it for different parameters. So maybe you wanna solve it where your atoms are this far apart, maybe this far apart, or this far apart. So you can kind of run this as you know, a parameterized equation where your, the bond length would be your variable. Um, so what might this look like in quantum serverless? We could take that program and that set of parameters ship it off to Kubernetes, we can let quantum serverless kind of parallelize it, run each quantum algorithm individually on separate quantum hardware, 
as individual processes, take those results, pull them back, and return them to the user. So that's what we're going to attempt to demo now. Um, let's see if we can jump back and forth again. All right, let's try this again. Okay, so now we got notebook two. All right, we can still read this. Perfect. Um, so the way we do this, we build a um, write a program in Python that's going to do the things we want to do. Um, which, um, for you know, to summarize this kind of quickly, we're going to build our 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 um, our atom using some of the quantum nature tooling. Um, what we're going to do here. That's this, you know, driver equals etc. Then we're going to do our quantum transformations. We're going to take our quantum algorithm, which is down here, where we're going to build a VQE, which is what we use to calculate the ground state energy of this um, molecule at this particular bond length. And then we'll return the results. Package it up in a Python script, and we can then ship that off to Kubernetes and run it. Um, so let's see, how are we going to do this? Uh, we're going to do it from a notebook. So we're going to import our stuff. We're going to make, so we're going to, we have a, there's a gateway that sits in front of the of Kubernetes that we use to send the things to, so to for um, resource management and that kind of thing. But we're going to declare an instance of quantum serverless that uses that gateway provider, which we shall do here. Um, then we are going to define our program. Our program, it takes, again, the Python input, um, uh, some dependencies. These are, you know, Python dependencies that we're going to add in, Kiskit nature. Um, our arguments, um, you know, which we're going to use is basically just a, we're going to just run a for loop with different um, bond lengths, and then we will pull those results back into a list of jobs. So let's do that. We've got three jobs. Now this is where it gets fun. We're going to see if this thing's actually going to run. Awesome. We're actually running. Um, and now we wait. And that was quick. Um, the, again, these are small examples. You know, real workloads can take longer, hence why the parallelization and the running things independently matters. Um, and then we can pull our results back. Um, so we can see that, you know, for bond length 2.55, we got a ground state energy of negative 7.58, uh, where three go. Three's down here. We got a negative 7.59. 3.55 is going to be negative 7.6. So again, as you're getting a little bit further apart, a little bit uh, different thresholds of energy. So that's kind of the parallelization bit. All right. Let's see. All right, so that's uh, that example. Um, last example, I think we're gonna have time to get through um, circuit knitting. So again, kind of Max mentioned, we've only got like so many qubits in quantum hardware. I think we're like 433 right now. Um, and that means we can build, you know, circuits that have less than 433 qubits in them. Um, but maybe we want to solve problems that are bigger than that. Now we can use some kind of, there, in certain instances, we can actually split a circuit in half into two smaller circuits that are mathematically equivalent to the larger circuits. So we can basically decompose this into smaller workloads, run those smaller workloads, recombine the results, and get the final result. And what's nice about this is when we split our circuit, we're able to split it into a smaller number of qubits so it can fit on the hardware that we have. Um, so that's what we call circuit cutting. Uh, it's part of this uh, circuit knitting toolkit that we have, which is also open source. And again, Kubernetes is our orchestrator. We're going to ship the job out to Kubernetes. It's going to run the circuit cutting. Um, it will then farm those um, sub-circuits out to a quantum machine, pull those results back, recombine them in Kubernetes, and ship, us back, ship them back to us as the user. Um, so we're going to demo this even quicker than we did the last one, uh, since we're running low on time. Um, if I can find my mouse. There it is. All right. Um, so circuit cutting. So um, what we're going to do is we're going to we're going to and again this is a small example. We can build bigger ones, but we're going to build an eight qubit circuit. Um, now obviously that could real you know in real life could fit on a quantum computer, but for our purposes we're going to pretend it can't. Um, so we've got an eight qubit thing. We're going to build our quantum serverless instance, and that what we're going to do in this case is we're going to run this locally. So we're going to run our quantum in our notebook, and then we're going to make. We're going to send remote calls out to Kubernetes. So we're going to run our individual functions. So instead of building it as like one Python script that we run um, in Kubernetes, here we're going to make individual calls that will run out to Kubernetes. Um, this is kind of more of like a you know data science type worker might be doing more stuff in a notebook as opposed to building out a kind of a full program. Um, so that's what we use here. We use this at uh, Quizkit remote function to basically declare this as a remote function um, that's going to do its thing. Then we're going to cut it. Um, so we'll run this cut circuit wires remote, 
That's going to take a little bit of time. Uh, we'll watch that kind of run its thing here. It'll give us some output. So right now, what happens is we've shipped this off to Kubernetes. It's running its thing. It's done some cutting. And now we've got, it's done a lot of cutting. Um, and eventually, we're going to get there. There we go. So now we've got two circuits. And we can, if we take a look at this, we'll see that we've got one circuit that's five qubits, another circuit that's five qubits. So we've taken that eight qubit um, circuit and made it into five. Uh, now we'll run it, and I know I'm running through this stuff really quickly. The, this stuff's all available online, and we've got links at the end, um, so you can see it. But we're going to, you know, evaluate it. Uh, we'll build a back end. Now we'll call again. We'll call another serverless thing, and this is going to be our evaluate sub-circuits. And we're done. Yep. Now we're going to reconstruct it. So again, split it in half, run each individual half, pull them back. And then let's, uh, let's run this again. Now, so this is going to verify the results. So the nice thing about this being a small example is we can actually run this, the full thing and we can compare the results of our split to the results of the full piece. And so that's what we're going to do here with this verify method. And what we can happen is, be, again, it's, it's quantum, so there's probability distributions, and we can pair the distributions of solutions from the full example to the two, uh, to the circuit cut example. And as you'll see down here at the bottom, they're exactly the same. So each use case has exactly the same probabilities, um, or the same probability distribution for that. So that's a way, that's again, how we can kind of parallelize big workloads, divide and conquer them, using Kubernetes to orchestrate them. All right. So. All right, so running low on time. So takeaway points here. Uh, three kind of big things I think to take away from this. One, we can use quantum to solve those hard problems um, that we kind of mentioned earlier. Some of those hard problems, not every one, but some of those hard problems we can solve with quantum. And if we combine quantum and classical, we're able to solve some of those bigger problems much faster. It kind of gives us, that's kind of the optimal way to this. It's not, it's not just quantum, it's not just classical, it's quantum and classical together. And you know, Kubernetes really is kind of the natural orchestrator for these types of workloads. Um, so again, yeah, that's kind of takeaways. We've got some links, I'm gonna put these, I think these things are online, there's QR codes, the links are at the bottom, um, and then we've got the feedback slide at the end. So I'll leave this up here for a minute to give people a chance to take pictures and maybe, do we have time for questions or you gotta, you know, we gotta, yeah. gotta Thank you, Paul. That was great. Uh, any questions? I'm sure you have some Thanks. Any questions at all? Okay. Yes. Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Thank you for the great talk. Uh, my question would be the, the, the Kubernetes. Um, that is actually running your serverless workloads on which infrastructure on which provider is this using? Where are you, where are you running this? Um, well, we, we, I mean, we're IBM, so we, we run ours on IBM Cloud, but they can run on any cloud. Anything yeah. that can run containers can I run I think this. you run on OpenShift, so. Yeah, it's OpenShift, on any Kubernetes. Cloud, so you can use the, yeah, Amazon, Google, Yes, yes. So those are in different <coughs> locations and then they are connected. Uh, yeah. Thanks. Uh, the example that you just run, did it run also or it took the decision to run in a quantum computer or it was completely simulated? Because. Yeah, so today I simulated them because networks, what could go wrong? Um, but just to make sure that it was, so I've got a local cluster. So what I showed today was a local Kubernetes cluster running on my laptop, but to make it run on, you know, AWS or IKS or any Kubernetes, you just would, it's the same deploy, um, use Helm, deploy it, and then you would just change the back end from simulator to quantum um, you, computer. You, you need a, an account and so on. But, yeah. you know, for experimentation, I think IBM, gives you uh, time on those, on 
a series of quantum computers that we have all over, so you can just apply for it and get get access to it. Okay, last question. Thank you. Um, if I um, remember back to the times where I was writing five-bit programs at IBM, um, that was kind of a batch process. So I, I sent them in and I got the results in the next morning. So that's probably not what fits in that classic concept that you have just provided. So if I download that, then I'm running a simulation, right? Yeah. Yeah, we, we showed very simple um, circuits. As I mentioned, like if you were to try to uh, run shores or any kind of you know um, real problems, you'd need a lot more circuit, um, a much bigger circuit, and then you'd have to cut it multiple times, and then use a real computer to combine. But this is what we're doing right now. So I think in the slides we showed where you can actually go and and if you wanted to contribute and try this, a lot of those Jupyter notebooks are there, so you can actually run them yourself. And then more importantly, um, all of the Qiskit, um, the circuit, um, sorry, the, the quantum serverless, all of that is open source. And uh, you can start using it right now. And if we so. had tried to run bigger things, we would have very quickly run out of time as I think we are being noticed that we are out of time. So thanks yeah. everybody for coming. Um, really appreciate it. <laughs> We're here for questions afterwards if you need it.